Okay, so it's live on YouTube. I am also going to share the streaming link in the chat in case any of you get kicked out for whatever reason. Use that link, inshallah. Okay. <coughs> I've got the chat enabled in Zoom, I hope. I really hope we don't get uh, Zoom bombed by someone. Um, someone said the volume is low. Is that for everyone? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Ahlan wa sahlan wa marhaban. Welcome everyone to today's lecture. Titled, How to make the most uh, of the day of Arafah. The day of Dua. Tayyip. Let me share my screen. So inshallah is going to be a short lecture today. The intention behind it is to remind myself and my dear brothers and sisters about this immense day which is upon us, which is going to be tomorrow inshallah ta'ala, the day of Arafah. And uh, how we can make the most of it. So um, to start, without any further ado, I say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. صلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما طيب uh, How to make the most of the day of Arafah the day of Dua uh, The first thing it's worth mentioning before we talk about the virtue of the day of Arafah So talk about the virtue of these 10 days Okay What's the virtue of these 10 days Then the best hadith that I can share with you in that regard is the hadith of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma who narrated that the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said um, قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ما من أيام العمل الصالح فيها أحب إلى الله من هذه الأيام there are no days during which righteous deeds are more beloved to Allah than these days meaning the first ten days of the uh, Hijjah يعني العشر قالوا يا رسول الله ولا الجهاد في سبيل الله قال ولا الجهاد في سبيل الله so the companions they asked they said oh messenger of Allah not even jihad in the cause of Allah okay uh, is that not better then the prophet ﷺ said no not even jihad in the cause of Allah unless a man goes out with himself and his wealth and does not bring anything back in other words there is nothing that you can do outside these 10 days are more virtuous yes apart from one thing which is that you do jihad for the sake of Allah and you go out with your wealth and your life and you come back with nothing you make the ultimate sacrifice beyond that my dear brothers and sisters whatever deeds you do outside these ten are not going to be at the same level or the same level of virtue as the good deeds you do in these ten days so just contemplate on that and that's why the scholars they mentioned that these are the best 10 days in the year period even better than the days of Ramadan so some scholars they say the nights of Ramadan are better especially the last 10 nights there's no doubt but in terms of days i.e. from Fajr until Maghrib there are no days better than these 10 days okay just wrap your head around that and obviously 8 of these days have gone there's only one day left which is tomorrow, the day of Arafah. And those of you that were aware of this hadith, those of you that, you know, um, felt the importance of these 10 days and made the best of it, I say, Hani Allakum. Congratulations, that's good. Allahumma barik, may Allah ta'ala accept it from you. Uh, those of you that treated these 10 days like any, or the past 8 days like any 8 days, yes, then I say to you, you've been deprived and I suppose that has to go back to ignorance, yes? So inshallah ta'ala, we hope that today's lecture benefits you, at least for the day of Arafah tomorrow, which is the best of these 10 days, or uh, inshallah ta'ala, in the coming years to come. 
and truth has to be said i've lived in the west myself for a long time and maybe i can't speak for all of the countries in the west but in the uk for example naam ramadan there's a vibe to it we all feel it ramadan is different but these 10 days in the uk or the time i spend in the uk there was no vibe to it not in the community not amongst the muslims they would just go by like any 10 days allahumma the day of arafah there would be a vibe it's not a vibe of ibadah rather it's a vibe of last minute shopping yes but the vibe of people doing the takbir saying allahu akbar allahu akbar la ilaha illa allah allahu akbar allah akbar illa alhamd at takbir al mutlaq this is the sort of takbir you should do from the first day until uh, the last day of eid rarely do you hear someone make those takbirs let alone on the streets even in the masajid or in amongst within the houses or amongst muslims themselves let alone going to the marketplace like abdullah ibn umar uh, radiyallahu anhum they used to do yes they used to go out to the marketplace and make takbir i think it was abdullah ibn umar and another companion uh, i can't recall which companion it was it was two companions abdullah ibn umar another companion they would go out and literally go out to the marketplace in order to make the takbir make it apparent this sha'ira min sha'airillah this if you like uh, you know sign of these 10 days and you know this great right they would go to the marketplace and say it out loud and when people hear, hear them do the takbir they would do takbir as well okay do you see this in the west i don't think so here in in muslim countries alhamdulillah you witness it here and there you come across it as a matter of fact one of the most amazing sights that i have seen in my life and you know i would have taken a video of it if it was appropriate but it wasn't somebody else's son but it was a little boy it was a little boy um maybe 10 years old 11 years old and he was literally <laughs> cycling around in the park on, on a cycle yes making the takbir Literally, he's on his bike saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. He's biking <laughs> inside the park, 10-year-old boy, doing the takbir. I remember witnessing that about two years ago. An unbelievable sight, okay? Only something you would obviously see, you know, in a Muslim country. And maybe in non-Muslim countries, but uh, I haven't, I've never come across that before. That was a beautiful sight. So the point I'm trying to make is, even the young children encourage you to make the takbir in the masajid you see here people say the takbir maybe even on the streets you hear the people say takbir so the, these 10 days if you like from the even if you didn't know the islamic date you know you'll, you'll know about it okay the imam reminds people and you hear people say takbir so there's a vibe to it yes not as strong as the ramadan vibe i wish it was everywhere in the world but that's not the case but when it comes to the west allah al-musta'an allah al-musta'an and all of you can you know, judge for yourself and look at your environment. Yes? Are these 10 days really special? People around you, in your close proximity. Yes? Do they treat these 10 days differently? Yes? If the answer is no, then certainly there, there's a problem there. There's a major problem there. There's a major problem there that needs to be rectified. Anyway, inshallah ta'ala, next year better. Um when it comes to day of arafah now if you've missed or you haven't made the most of the past eight days i say to you all is not lost La, rather the best is yet to come alhamdulillah which is day of arafah tomorrow so what are the virtues of the day of arafah the virtues of day of arafah are many and um, I'll, I'll, uh, i left out a few of them when i want to talk about at the end what the best things that you can do are so some of the virtues are related to things that you can do. There are certain things that you do on the day of Arafah where you would get immense rewards, okay? So we'll mention them later. But for now, when it comes to the virtue of the day of Arafah, let's just stick to one virtue, one thing, one hadith, okay? Which is the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha, who said and who reported that the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, so this is the Arabic over here, um, 
ان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال ما من يوم اكثر من ان يعتق الله فيه عبدا من النار من يوم عرفه وانه لا يدنو ثم يباهي بهم الملائكه فيقول ما اراد هؤلاء there's no day when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sets free more servants from hell than day of arafah it's a day of forgiveness it's a day of salvation from the nar it's a day when he allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself draws near to his servants and then he praises uh, them to the angels yes and he boasts about the large number of people that are there asking him and he says what do these want he says to the angels what do these want and obviously the question the answer is they want jannah they want forgiveness they want to be uh, saved from hellfire so that's why on that day it's the day when most people are saved from the hellfire so do not deprive yourself on that day okay be from those people who are saved from the hellfire on that day how do you become from those people who are saved on, on that day from hellfire of course by by making use of that day okay by working hard on that day by focusing more on your akhirah on, on that day than your dunya. When everybody is out and about shopping for their dunya, you are in the masjid shopping for your akhirah. Okay? Um, having said that, the day of Arafah, arguably being the best day of the year. Yes? The best day of the year. Okay, scholars they differ. Is it Yom Al Nahar or Yom Arafah? Is it the day of Eid, the tenth day, or the ninth day? They they they, they differed, right? Uh, but some scholars say Arafah. Some scholars they say the day of uh, Al Hajj Al Akbar is the tenth day, specifically for those people who are doing Hajj. But nevertheless, the best day of the year, if not one of the best days of the year, even though it's so virtuous, on this year Arafah this year is even more special. There's even more to it, yes, uh, which obviously is the fact that Yom Arafah is going to be on a Friday. That's a rare occurrence, and that's an amazing opportunity. All of you know the uh, verse in Surah Al Buruj where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Wal Yom Al Maud wa Mashhud." Three days Allah has mentioned. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala took an oath by way of three days in these verses. اليوم الموعود وشاهد ومشهود. So the Messenger Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم said in the Hadith, اليوم الموعود, the promised day is the day of resurrection. واليوم المشهود, the attended day is the day of Arafah. And الشاهد, the witness is Friday. Okay, so those are the, those three days, day of judgment, every fr- Friday. And the day of Arafah. So then the Messenger of said, The sun does not rise nor set upon a day that is more virtuous than it, i.e. Friday. In it, there is an hour in which no believing worshipper makes a supplication to Allah for good, except that Allah answers it for him. And he does not seek Allah's aid for something except that he aids him in it. So Friday already being the best day of the week. Yes, Arafah is on the best day of the week. Okay, this is a rare occurrence that makes this day even more special. Okay, so keep that in mind. Tomorrow is not just Yom Arafah, it's also Friday. Okay, so what's the best thing you can do on that day? Obviously, I'm sure all of you now are supercharged for this day, for the day of Arafah, to make the most of it. You can't wait. Yes, so... What's the best thing that you can do? How can you make the most of that day? And that's the title of today's lecture. Okay? Now, first thing you can do, you should definitely do, and you should prepare for now, and have the intention for, inshallah ta'ala, as well, and make preparations that you should fast tomorrow. Okay? Because it's an expiation for the sins of the preceding year and the current year. Like Abu Qatada, uh, radiallahu anh, reported that the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa said, uh, in a hadith, he was asked about the observance of Psalm on the day of Arafah. Okay, so the Prophet said, uh, That it's an expiation for the sins of the preceding year and the current year. 
forgiveness of sins for two years. Okay? The sagair, obviously, the minor sins, the major sins, they need tawbah, which obviously is an amazing opportunity to make tawbah on this day. Right? So, with tawbah, yes, which is to have regret for what you did and feel bad about it and have this resolved that you're not going to do it again. If you have that about the major sins that you've committed and at the same time, you fast the day of Arafah. Wallahi, you can, you can have Eid with no sins. A completely empty slate. Rabbul Kaaba. Wallahi, it's possible. We've all sinned over the decades, over the years. Wallahi, wa billahi, wa tallahi. You can have an Eid on Saturday without any sin. Like a newborn baby, without even going to Hajj. How? Make Toba for all of your sins. Yes? If you make tawbah, Allah will forgive your sin. All of it. Prophet ﷺ said, At-tawbah to tajubbu ma qablaha. That the tawbah wipes away everything that comes before it. Okay? And then on top of that, fast day of Arafah, and that's even more of an emphasis that your sins will be forgiven, inshallah, for this year and the previous year. Okay? So fast, my dear brothers and sisters. Secondly, Yom Arafah is a day of dua. It definitely should be a day where you put your hand up and you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what you need. Like we said, people go out shopping for their dunya, for their Eid, you go shopping for your akhirah. And if I wanted this whole lecture to be about the importance of dua, it could have been. Yes, but we'll leave that for another day inshallah. I already promised all of you that inshallah, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the ability, we'll do a series on dua, its importance, its mannerisms, and everything related to, 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 to dua. Insha'Allah Ta'ala. Okay? But for now, let's talk about the importance of dua. So much that can be said about the importance of dua. Prophet ﷺ said, dua hu al-ibadah. Dua is worship. It's the essence of worship. Okay? But, just keep one thing in mind. Dua is the key to all good. Wallahi, there is nothing that you want to achieve. Rabb al-Ka'bah. Except that it's in the hands of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And Wallahi, there's nothing that you fear Except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can protect you from it. If that's the case, and all of the good is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and protection from all evil is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where are you going to seek it? Let's use some common sense. If that's the case, wh how, wh what steps are you meant to take to achieve that? I mean, if for example, yes, to give an example in our dunya affairs, yes, imagine you have a need at some kind of government facility, right? And you need you need to get something done, right? And you know that the only person that can help you with that is let's say the MP or the minister or whatever, whoever is in charge of that department. Yes? There is no doubt that you would think about how can I get to this individual, present my case, yes? So that he can help me out. Because there's no other way. He's the only one that has the authority to say yes or no. You wouldn't think twice. That's your dunya. When it comes to your Lord, when it comes to your deen, when it comes to your akhirah, none of us doubt. قُلِ اللَّهُمَّ مَالِكَ الْمُلْكِ تُؤْتِ الْمُلْكَ مَنْ تَشَاءُ وَتَنْزِعُ الْمُلْكَ مَنْ تَشَاءُ وَتُعِزُّ مَنْ تَشَاءُ وَتُذِلُّ مَنْ تَشَاءُ بِيَدِكَ الْخَيْرِ In your hands is all good. إِنَّكَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ Indeed you are capable of everything. None of us doubt that. If that's the case and none of us doubt that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the owner of everything, then why do we try everything that we can to achieve our objectives? Minus dua. Dua is the last thing that we do. Why is that the case? We have to ask ourselves, my dear. We have to really, you know, retrospectively, you know, look, look at ourselves. When it comes to you want to find a job, when it comes to illness, when it comes to death, when it comes to family problems, it doesn't matter what it is. You are always keen to take the steps to resolve it. You're looking for a job, you go on LinkedIn, you make your profile, you apply to certain jobs, blah, blah, you do everything. Right? You have family problems, okay, you get in touch with the in-laws and you try to resolve it. You have, you feel pain. You're sick. Yes? Straight away, you're on the phone call, call the GP, make an appointment. Sah? There's nothing wrong with all of these steps. That's what you're meant to do. It's, co it's called taking the steps.
right? So in Arabic, it's called al akhud bil asbab, taking the means. This is something that is legislated. Great, mashallah alaik, you're good. But why do you leave behind the greatest of all means? Why? Why not? Before you call the GP, what if you instead, like the Prophet Sallallahu said in a hadith, whoever feels pain, let him say Bismillah three times, and they say Bismillah, 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 A'udhu Billahi wa Qudratihi min shari ma ajidu wa hadir. Why not? Say that seven times, Prophet Sallallahu said. I seek refuge in Allah, and Allah Ta'ala's ability to do everything. From the evil of that which I feel, and what I fear. So you think you've got a headache, you, 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 worst case scenario, you think maybe, whatever, I might have this, I might have that. You have got stomach pain, you, maybe I, I've got, I, got, I got poison, whatever. I got food poisoning. Whatever it is, the worst case scenario is in your head, yes, just make that dua. That's the first thing. Then grab the phone and call the GP, no problem. No problem. You're indebted. Before you call all your relatives or your friends, before you do that, do it inshallah if you have to, but before, before you do it, make dua. Maybe you don't even need to call them. Okay, the point I'm trying to make is that, unfortunately, we don't realize that du dua is the greatest of all means of achieving whatever we want. Absolutely. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the musabbib al-asbab. He is the one who has made the qadr for everything and He has made means to achieve things. And He has made certain things a, a, a factor or a reason for certain things happening. Yes, so they say cause and effect, cause and effect. There's no cause and effect. It's all in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is the one who has created the cause and Allah subhanahu wa is the one who creates the effect. Ibrahim alayhi salam. Didn't his people throw him into the fire? If we go by cause and effect, you have fire, what's the effect? To get burned. Sah? Ever seen fire that doesn't burn? Nah. In Ibrahim's case, the fire didn't burn. Why didn't the fire not burn? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's the one that creates the cause and He's the one that creates the effect. Allah said to the fire, which is meant to burn, Kuni bardan wa salaman ala Ibrahim. Be cool and gentle on Ibrahim. Don't harm him. So the fire didn't burn. If that's the case, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us that story in the Quran? Okay, let's talk about cause and effect. Isn't it old age should stop one from having children, right? So, so how did Zakaria السلام, and his wife, both old in age, how did they have Yahya as a child? How? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's the one that creates the cause. Why did Allah tell us about that story? Okay, somebody being swallowed by a, uh, a whale or if you like, some kind of animal, right? Being devoured. Isn't that cause for dying? Ever, ever heard of someone, you know, being swallowed by an animal and then coming out back alive? Naam, Yunus alayhi salam. It happened. Okay? And all of the stories in the Quran, we can go back to the Quran, they're all full of miracles. Yani, somebody dies, they died. Sah? Can they come back to life? La. From the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah's rules that He set in place, people are resurrected on the day of judgment. But with the permission of Allah, Isa alayhi salam brought the dead back to life. Because Allah is the one who creates the cause and effect. Now, if that's the case, why are we so stuck to all of the means, but we live off the greatest of means? which is dua. Why? goes back to our ignorance. We don't really understand what dua is. So inshallah ta'ala, hopefully that series, once we speak about that, hopefully that will clear things up. Right? However, my dear brothers and sisters, keep this in mind. Always make dua the first step you take. And then take every other step you need to take. Inshallah. Okay? Having said that, having said that, bring it back in line with today's lecture. All of you have wishes, no doubt. All of you have things that you want to be resolved. There are things that you fear. Every single one of you. Yes? I say to you, Wallahi, yes? You will rarely come across a better opportunity than tomorrow. Even now, don't leave it till tomorrow. Even now make the dua, no problem. Make it tonight. Wake up last third, of course, of the night. But even more so, if anything, do not miss tomorrow. Okay? Dua is the key to all good. And I've shared this uh, along with the description of this lecture today. And one of the students said that it touched, it, it struck a chord with him. And hopefully it struck a chord with all of you. It did for me, definitely. When I read this narration, I saw Dua in a completely different light. 
uh, the great Tabi Atta ibn Abi Rabah, he said, when Allah releases your tongue and makes it easy for you to make dua, then know that Allah wants to grant you that which you desire. Regardless of how great your desire or request is, you find yourself constantly asking Allah for something, know that that thing is meant for you, inshallah, it's on its way. Why is that? He gives an example, he says, so if you find yourself always asking Allah for al-firdaus, constantly, you're in sujood, you're saying, Allah minni asaluku jannat al-firdaus, bi ghayri hisabin wa la Oh Allah, I ask you jannat al-firdaus, without any reckoning or punishment. You say that in your, in your sujood. You say that regularly, between adhan and iqamah. Yes? Then know that Allah wants you to enter into jannat al-firdaus. Why? Because otherwise, if Allah did not want you to enter into Jannah al-Firdaus, he, he would have prevented you from making that dua like he has prevented others besides you. And this is the greatest irony in life. Wallahi billah. Let's, let's stop looking at other people. Like I said, let's judge ourselves. Every single one of you today on this call or anybody that's going to watch this video, inshallah, on YouTube, I say to you right now, I'll give you 10 seconds, 20 seconds, I want you to think to yourself, yes? What's the greatest thing on your mind and when's the last time you asked Allah? Ask yourself. What's the greatest thing on your mind? What's the greatest wish that you have? What's the greatest fear that you have? And when's the last time you asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or you sought refuge in Him from that thing? If the answer is, well, lies is a long time ago. I can't remember. Not that often. Question is, why? Why? What's stopping you? Wallahu yaghdabu hina tatruku su'alahu wa bunayya adama hina yus'alu yaghdabu Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes angry with you when you stop asking him whereas the mankind they become angry with you when you ask him when you ask them Why didn't you ask Allah? Do you think Allah is going to be upset with you? La as a matter of fact, Allah becomes angry with you if you don't ask. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what's stopping you? And I remember one of the students who commented said, you know, it's a bit scary. Why am I from those who, who is prevented? Well, if it... This narration shouldn't make you lose hope. It should fill you with hope. If it is that you haven't made the dua like you should have, yes? And I say, it's not because, I'm not going to say it's because you're from those who are prevented. It's out of ignorance. And the fact that you came across this narration right now, which made you think that itself is a good sign. Ask yourself, how, how fortunate are you to now see dua the way it should be seen? How fortunate are you to now have this insight into dua? Alhamdulillah. So that should push you towards making more dua. It shouldn't make you lose hope. Make the dua. There's nothing stopping you, Wallah. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because, like Umar, Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu said, إِنِّي لَا أَحْمِلُ هَمُّ الْإِجَابَةِ Umar said, I do not carry the burden of my dua being accepted. That's not my worry. وَلَكِنِّي أَحْمِلُ هَمُّ الدُّعَى For indeed, if you've been given to make the dua, then the acceptance is, comes with it. It's one package. Been given the tawfiq to make dua. And when I say tawfiq to make dua, obviously, making dua with all of its conditions and avoiding all of its, all of the things that, that nullify your dua. Because some of you might be like, well, I know this guy who always makes dua, but nothing is better. There are conditions. Right, and that's where knowledge comes in. That's where the importance of knowledge comes in. You might be making dua for 60 years and not one of your duas are accepted because you are doing one of those things that nullify your dua or you're not fulfilling the conditions. So that's, that itself is a different story altogether. But if you make dua and you fulfill the conditions and you avoid those things that nullify your dua, then know that the acceptance to your dua is a guarantee. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمُ أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ Allah said, call upon me, I will answer your call. وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبُ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِي إِذَا دَعَانِ If my servants ask you about me, then tell them I am close. I answer the call of those that call me. 
So the only thing between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answering your call is you asking Him. That's the only thing between you and achieving your objectives. There is nothing in between you and achieving whatever you want to achieve apart from you making dua, fulfilling its conditions and avoiding those things that nullify your dua. That's the only thing in between you and whatever you want to achieve. Naam. Because all in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah wants, wants it for you, you will get it. We can talk about this all day, yes? But, yani, dua, Allah is greater than what we think, what we can imagine. Taib. And like I said, you won't come across a better time to make dua all year than tomorrow. I just want you to contemplate on how many asbab you can gather. Yani dua, dua, there are certain factors that make your dua more likely to be accepted. Okay? For example, your state in terms of your ibadah, if you're close to Allah or not. Those people that are closer to Allah and worship Him and stay away from sins, they're more likely for their duas to be accepted. Your state is one, one affair. Or even if you're in a state of dire necessity, then Allah Taala is more likely to accept your dua. If you're oppressed, yes? So it's something you have to do with your state. Yes, if you're upon tuhid or not. Other things have to do with the time, right? There are certain times when your dua is more likely to be accepted. Sometimes it's got to do with the place. There are certain places, if you're there, your dua is more likely to be accepted. Yes? From them, obviously, being in a masjid or, generally speaking, Mecca, closer to the Kaaba by the Multazam, Dave Arafah being there. There are certain places, right? There are certain deeds, there are certain mannerisms. If you fulfill them, your dua is more likely to be accepted. The more of these factors that you gather in your dua, and the more of these boxes that you tick, the more likely your dua is accepted. Now obviously some of them, we can control some of these factors. Okay? And there are some factors that are opportunities. They come and they go. It's not in our hands. We can't, we can't get them whenever we like. Okay? So inshallah, talking about those factors that are in your control, all of that, all of that inshallah we'll talk about when we get to the dua series. But for now, let's talk about the factors that you can that are there tomorrow, a one-off opportunity that all come together on that day, Yom Arafah, on a Friday, that you're not going to have on Saturday, and you're not going to have on Sunday. Let's, let's talk about those. Number one, of course, you will be fasting. Okay? Tomorrow, the last hour of Friday, is an opportunity. Like we mentioned earlier in the hadith at the beginning, Prophet said there's an hour every Friday. The scholars, they mentioned the last hour of Friday. Yes, even though it could be anywhere within Friday, but the strongest opinion is that towards the end of, of the Friday, i.e. before Maghrib, um, where your dua is accepted. You have between the Adhan and the Iqama. The fact that it's the day of Arafah, that's an opportunity that you're not going to have on Saturday. Okay? So obviously, the Adhan and the Iqama, that's every day. Towards the end of the Salah, when you're doing a Tahiyyat as well, is the place where your dua gets accepted. But the point I'm trying to say is you can kind of like have all of these if you go to the masjid. Alright, and this is my advice to you. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gives me the tawfiq myself first and foremost to implement this. I advise you, specifically the brothers. Yes? And the sisters as well, maybe a corner in their house. I advise you tomorrow after you pray asr, first pray asr in the jama'ah in the masjid. And make sure you're there by adhan time. When the adhan is being made, make the du'as to be made for adhan. That's a time that your du'a is accepted. Between adhan and iqamah, make du'a is a time where your du'a is accepted. While you're praying the salat al-asr itself, in your sujood, in your tashahud, make du'a, it's time where du'a is accepted. And then stay in the masjid until maghrib. And do a lot of good deeds, which again, like we said, doing good deeds before making du'a is a factor that makes your du'a more likely to be accepted. So read some Quran, seek some forgiveness, yes, give some sadaqah, and then towards the end, before Maghrib, last hour on Friday, put your hands up and make dua until Maghrib. You will have gathered all of these factors: your fasting, last hour on Friday, day of Arafah. You made dua between Adhan Iqama towards the end of the prayer. Anything on your mind? what you're looking for, whatever you know that you wanted to achieve, you wanted to get married for so long, wallahi, this is your chance. 
you want finally want that debt to be paid off this is your chance you've been struggling with you've been struggling financially or uh, in terms of your health in terms of your family wallahi you will never come across a better chance you've always been hoping to seek knowledge or you've asked allah that he takes you out of the non muslim countries and he facilitates for you that you live in a muslim country whatever is on your mind your parents died you want to make dua for them maybe you're, maybe you're uh, from a non muslim background and you want your families to accept islam maybe your parents maybe your brothers your sisters wallahi there's no better opportunity what a kaaba do these things don't make this opportunity go by you will not come across a better time all year and only Allah knows if you'll make it to next year. What should you ask for? Well, I've mentioned some things when it comes to your dunya needs. But, like we said before, when it comes to dua, my dear brothers and sisters, one of the best duas to make, generally speaking, one of the principles when it comes to making dua, is that you keep your dua as encompassing and general as possible. And those were the du'as of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa His du'as would be jawami al adriya There would be du'as that are very general and encompassing and not specific du'as asking for A, B, C, D, E, F, Y, Z. La. Why is that the case? Why is that the case? Why shouldn't you specifically ask, Oh Allah, make it easy for me to marry that sister. Or Oh Allah, make it easy for me to marry. Oh Allah, make it easy for me to buy a house. Oh Allah, Pay off this particular debt that I have that you know of. Oh Allah, cure me of this disease, particular disease that I have today. La, don't, don't. You can go specific, maybe towards the end of your dua. There's nothing wrong with that. But however, you're much better off keeping your dua general and open. Why? Because Allah knows what's good for you. Allah knows what's good for you. Allah knows better than you what's good for you. So why not leave that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Why not ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all of the good in this world and hereafter? One of the du'as Prophet used to make most often is Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adab al nahr. Done, khalas, that's it. Just if, you, if, if there's one du'a, just that du'a you made it for the rest of your life, you'd be in a very good state in this world and hereafter. Oh Allah, give us good in this world, give us good in the hereafter, and protect us from the hellfire. That's it. If, if, if Allah, when you say to Allah, oh Allah, give me all the good in this world, or give me good in this world, Allah knows better than you what's good for you. You might think that this particular sister is good for you to get married to. You might think that this particular house is good for you to buy. You might think that all of your happiness, yes, uh, is, is connected to that particular job or paying off your debt. Or you think, oh Allah, cure me from this disease. Okay, what if Allah cures you from this disease and He answers your dua, but there's another disease that was meant to come yes because you know true the Prophet mentioned in the hadith la yurdu al-qadha illa dua yes the dua can protect you from the qadr not in a sense that not in, don't get me wrong it's not in a sense that you have to understand the hadith properly it's not that Allah didn't know that this you were going to make dua and that Allah had pre-decreed that this is going to happen to you and then the dua is la the dua itself is from qadr Okay, it was written that this was meant to happen to you. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from His perfect knowledge, He also knew that on this day, Yom Arafah, you would make this dua, and that dua then would overcome the qadr. In that sense, that's how you understand the hadith, right? So yes, it's true. So you might ask for something specifically when there's something else you're in more need of. Okay, so... Pay attention, my dear brothers and sisters. Keep your dua as general as possible. That's why the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is one hadith of many different hadiths. This is the principle you'll find in the Prophet sallallahu alaihi hadith. He teaches his companions this principle. A man came to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and said, "Messenger of Allah, what's the best supplication?" He answered, "Asking Allah for forgiveness and well-being in this world and the next world." Okay. Al Afu al Afi is called in Arabic. Okay. قال رسول الله العفو والعافية في الدنيا والآخرة. Then the same companion came back the following day, okay? And he asked the same question. He said, 
what's the best supplication that I can make? The Prophet ﷺ said, again, العفو والعافية في الدنيا والآخرة العفو والعافية في الدنيا والآخرة فإذا أعطيت العافية في الدنيا والآخرة فقد أفلحت If you are given If you like العفو which is forgiveness and عافية well-being in this world and the next world then you're successful What more do you want? Okay? And there's another hadith where Prophet ﷺ he would advise his own uncle العباس and say to him Oh Abbas ask Allah for العافية he would keep reminding constantly, ask Allah for afiyah. Okay? So, ask Allah for al-afu and al-afiyah. So there's a, there's a dua that says, Allahum inni yas'aluk al-afu wa al-afiyah fi dunya wa al-akhirah. Allahum inni yas'aluk al-afu wa al-afiyah fi dini wa dunya wa ahli wa mali. Allahum mastur aurati wa amin ra'ati. Allahum mahfadni min bayni yaday wa min khalfi wa an yameen wa an shimali wa a'udhu bi a'zabatika nukhtana min tahti. And I'll share it inshallah with your resource with all of these duas. Right? This dua says, Oh Allah, give me forgiveness and well being in this world and hereafter. Oh Allah, give me well being in my in my dunya and in my wealth and in my family and, and so on and so forth. So that's one thing you can ask for. And all the other, generally speaking, all of the authentic prophetic duas that you can get your hands on, make those duas. Okay? Okay, those prophetic, authentic duas might not mention your specific situation. They might not have what you are struggling with. Sah, I agree with you. But they encompass it. It's included. Whatever comes to whatever you are struggling with. All of you, all 102 of you on this call. Right? Whatever issues and problems that you have, it is covered by the authentic prophetic du'as of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu Okay? And then if you ask for something specific, it's allowed. Nothing wrong with that. Make sure your dua is not always specific. Keep it as general as much as possible and ask for specific things inshallah as needs be. And I want to remind you as well to increase in sending praise upon Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam because it's Friday Aslan. It's one of the best days to do so. Prophet sallallahu alayhi told us, he reminded us, he told us to increase in saying Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama salli ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim on Fridays. So tomorrow is Friday. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi said in a hadith among the best of your days is Friday. So supplicate Allah more often for me in it. So since the best day, we should make the best dua. The best dua that you can make is sending salah upon, upon Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Because wherever salah you send upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah will send praise upon you or will send his mercy upon you ten times, tenfold. Tenfold. Okay? So Prophet said, for your supplications will be displayed to me. Type. Definitely. And the more you increase in sending the salah upon the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the more likely you are to be in his vicinity, inshallah, on the Day of Judgment. No doubt. Okay? Um, and generally speaking, the authentic prophetic duas that you can get your hands on. I remember I've shared with you before in Ramadan, the duas from this book called Tabseer Al-Nasik Bi Ahkam Al-Manasik by Sheikh Abdul Muhsin Al-Badr. Sheikh Abdul Muhsin Al-Abbad Al-Badr. Hafizahullah Ta'ala. Allah one of the best resources for dua. Me personally, me personally, first time I've done, I think Umrah, or maybe Hajj, I can't remember. At least for the past 15 years. Whenever I go do, to do Umrah, whenever I go do Hajj, I've got this book with me. Always. Allahu Akbar. It's such an amazing resource. The Shaykh, Hafizahullah Ta'ala, scholar of Hadith, the Muhaddith of Al-Madina, He's gathered all of the ahadith and even ayat as well from the Qur'an uh, that have to do with dua. Authentic ones in one place. And I came across this website, MashaAllah, Allahumma Barik. They have the Arabic, they have the English. And I also shared a PDF with you, I remember, uh, in the tafsir program in Ramadan. So I'll, I'll post a link to this uh, website, inshallah ta'ala, in the, in, the, in the Zoom chat. All you need to do, yes? All you need to do, like I said, be there for Asr and just read through this document. Print it out beforehand, take it with you if you want, so that you don't get distracted by your phone and WhatsApp messages, whatever. Print it out, take it with you to the masjid, and just go through these du'as. Every single du'a in here is either an ayah from the Qur'an or an authentic hadith. Okay? And wallahi, they are so beautiful. Allahumma barik. They are so beautiful du'as. Unbelievable. Not just are you making du'a, it increases you in iman, you're learning correct aqeedah 
and you, you can rest assured that you're not making a dua that angers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because unfortunately, sometimes these duas that are made up, they have within them things that go against the sharia. They anger Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let alone making Allah pleased with you. But with these duas from Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa all of them, you can rest assured that they're going to be the best duas that you can make. Okay? Even one of the duas that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa used to make, teaching us as well that we should make it is, Allah minni as'aluka min khayri ma sa'alaka nabiyyuka abduka Muhammad. Oh Allah, I ask you from the good that your Prophet and servant Muhammad has asked you from. Has asked you of. Whatever Muhammad has asked you, Allah, I ask you as well. And anything that your messenger and your abd, your servant Muhammad has sought refuge from, oh Allah, I seek refuge from. How encompassing is this dua? And this is actually a longer dua, dua that starts with uh, Allahumma uh, Allah min yas'aluka min al-khayr kullihi ajilihi wa ajilih ma alintu minhu wa ma lam a'lam wa a'udhu bika min al-sharr kullihi ajilihi wa ajilih ma alintu minhu wa ma lam a'lam Allah min yas'aluka min khayri ma sa'alaka nabiyyuka abduka Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa a'udhu bika min sharr ma 'adha bihi nabiyyuka abduka Muhammad Allah min yas'aluka al-jannata wa ma qarrab ilayha min qawlin wa 'amal wa a'udhu bika min an-nar wa ma qarrab ilayha min qawlin wa 'amal wa as'aluka Allahumma an taj'ala kullu qada'in qadaytahu li khayra wallahi you'll never come across more encompassing du'a than that one of the most encompassing du'as you'll come across. Let's see if I can find it here actually. Here we go. There we go. Oh Allah, I ask you for all good things. Both in the immediate and distant future. This world hereafter, everything. All of the good. Whether I know about them or not. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. <laughs> even, even the good that you don't know about, you're asking Allah. <laughs> the good that I know and the good that I don't know. Oh Allah, you know. You're the most knowledgeable. You have knowledge of everything. The good that you know, Allah asks for that as well. <laughs> Allah, if you were to make this kind of request to <laughs> Bani Adam, right? People would say, this guy's greedy. La, there's no greed when it comes to dua. When it comes to dua, asking Allah, ask what comes to you, what comes to your mind. There's no greed in it. As a matter of fact, it draws you nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It shows that you are someone who's smart. Okay? I seek refuge with you from all evil things, both in the immediate and distant future. Whether I know about them or not. <laughs> the evil that I know, the evil that I don't know, oh Allah, protect me from all of it. Oh Allah, I ask you for the good which your worshipping servant and prophet asked you of you. Anything prophet asked you of, I ask you as well. And I seek refuge with you from the evil which your worshipping worshiping servant and prophet sought refuge from. Oh Allah, I ask you to grant me Jannah, as well as all words and deeds that bring me closer to it. Allah, give me Jannah and Anything that brings me closer to Jannah, give it to me. Word, words of deeds. Words or deeds. And I seek refuge in you from hellfire. As well as all words and deeds that bring me closer to it. And then look at the end of the dua. I implore you to grant me good in all that you have ordained for me. Anything that you have ordained for me, Allah, I ask you that you grant me good in it. What good has this dua left out? What evil has this dua not protected you from? Think of it. That's just one dua. Wallahi, they're all beautiful. They're all so, so beautiful duas, mashallah. I wish I could go through all of them now, but the time doesn't uh, admit us to do so. Inshallah ta'ala, in the future, we'll go through these dua, we'll explain them, and, and inshallah ta'ala, we'll memorize them as well. Bithnillah al-kareem. Okay? Inshallah, for now, I'll send the link. I'm sure most of you can't wait. Let me post the link now. Uh, link. I might have to like. Someone sent the PDF as well. Barakallah Yeah. There you go. There's the link. You can also use the PDF if you want. Bye. Someone said, how about the fortress of Muslim, Hassan Muslim? It's a good, it's a good book, inshallah. It's a good book. Okay? But there's a lot of ahadith or du'as that you make circumstantially when you do this. When you, but this hadith, la, these du'as, the shaykh actually gathered them specifically for the person doing hajj and umrah. This book, Tabseer al-Nasik, Bi-Ahkam al-Manasik, it's for the person doing hajj or umrah. So the shaykh, within that book, he has a chapter where he said, these are du'as from the Quran and the Sunnah that are suitable for the hajj or the mu'tamir to make these du'as. 
So they're not circumstantial du'as like what to say when you get up, what to say when you sit down. These are good, and that's what the most most of du'as in Hassan al-Muslim. But these are all general du'as. Okay? Not circumstantial ones. So that's why I advise you with this book tomorrow on the day of Arafah. Okay? Now, I'm going to share with you an excerpt from one of the books of Ibn Qayyim, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, where he talks about certain factors. We talked about certain things you can do to make your dua more likely to be accepted. So he listed 12 of them over here. Okay? We're going to go through them, inshallah, quickly. He says, إِذَا جَمَعَ مَعَ الدُّعَى If, with dua, if you actually make dua, and he's talking about dua being the key to all good, right? In that context. So he mentioned that if Allah gives you the ability to make dua, yes, and along with your dua you to fulfill these 12 steps, then he says towards the end, فَإِنَّ هَذَا الدُّعَى لَا يكاد يُرَدُّ أَبَدًا He said it's highly unlikely that such a dua is rejected. Ever. So what are these? What are these steps? He says, إِذَا جَمَعَ مَعَ الدُّعَاءِ حُضُورَ الْقَلْبِ وَجَمْعِيَّتَهُ بِكُلِّيَّتِهِ عَلَى الْمَطْلُوبِ First and foremost, paying attention to what you're asking for. Prophet ﷺ said, Inna Allah la yaqbalu. Or Prophet ﷺ mentioned in the hadith, Allah does not accept the dua min qalbin ghafirin lah. Allah doesn't accept the dua from a heart that is unattentive. Yes? A heart that's heedless. Sometimes we make dua, we're not even, we're not even focused on what we're asking for. Specifically, unfortunately, those of you that don't know Arabic, yes? If you go and you get a book in uh, the books of dua and you read in Arabic, you don't know what it says. If you don't even know what you're asking Allah for, okay, you'll get rewarded, absolutely, sah. You know, and if you can't find a translation, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He doesn't hold people accountable for what they're not capable of, for, 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 doesn't burden them with, with anything they can't, they can't do. But having said that, nevertheless, actually knowing what you're asking for and being attentive is a major factor in your dua being accepted. So if you don't even understand what you're asking for, May Allah accept your dua, but you've missed out on this major factor, which is hudur al-qalb, being attentive to what you're asking for. وَصَادَفَتْ وَقْتًا مِنْ أَوْقَاتِ الْإِجَابَةِ sit. And he said, on top of that, you also make this dua during one of the six times in which dua is accepted, which is the last third of the night, uh, when the adhan is being called. Between adhan and iqamah, at the end of the salawat, i.e., you know, when, the, when you're doing at-tahiyyat, and when the Imam goes up to the mimbar on the day of Jum'ah uh, uh, until the end of the Salah, obviously not while he's doing khutbah, but when he's going up there and between the break, between the khutbah and so on and so forth and the Salah. وَآخِرُ سَاعَةٍ بَعْدَ الْعَصْرِ And the last hour after Asr on Friday, which we talked about. These are six times in which dua is accepted. Times, okay? So if you make dua during these times and you're attentive, وصادف خشوعا في القلب وانكسارا بين يدي الرب وذلا له وتضرعا ورقة. and on top of that you are humble towards your Lord. you have a heart that is humble, broken, yes, in front of its Lord. in humility, knowing that you are making dua to al Jabbar, that you are in need of it and you feel this in your heart, the need that you have for your Lord. واستقبل الداعي القبلة you turn towards the قبلة. وَكَانَ عَلَىٰ طَهَارَ While you have wudu. وَرَفَعَ يَدَيْهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ And you raise your hands towards Allah. وَبَدَأَ بِحَمْدِ اللَّهِ وَالثَّنَاءِ عَلَىٰ And you start by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and exalting Him. ثُمَّ ثَنَّا بِالصَّلَاةِ عَلَىٰ مُحَمَّدٍ عَبْدِهِ وَرَسُولِهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم And then you follow that up with sending the salah and the blessings upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. ثُمَّ قَدَّمَ بَيْنِ يَدَيْ حَاجَتِهِ and you make tawbah from your sins. المسألة, and you keep on repeating the same dua. This is one of the mannerisms of dua. Don't ask just once and be like, I asked. La. Keep on asking, keep on asking. Don't give up. Don't give up. You know, the more you knock, imagine you go to someone that you need, you knock on the door once, they don't open it. Someone you're really in need of, they're not that happy with you, you knock the door, they're like, no, I don't want to open the door. Imagine you keep on knocking. It's just a matter of time before that person opens the door. Same thing. الإلحاح في الدعاء constantly asking Allah not giving up is itself a major factor for your dua being accepted and Prophet Sallallahu mentioned that Allah will accept the dua of everyone Allah will accept your dua ما لم يستعجل as long as you're not hasty 
If you're hasty, Allah will not accept it. What is being hasty? Prophet told us that the hasty is that you say, I asked Allah and He didn't answer me. Once you have that mentality, forget it. Your dua is not accepted. Forget it. Khalas. Give up. Once you come with the mentality of, I asked Allah, I asked Allah, I asked Allah, Allah's not answering my dua, you, you've lost it. Maybe Allah already answered your dua, but you don't know. Because answering your dua doesn't mean you just, you achieved or you get that thing you asked for. It can be in one of three ways. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might give you what you asked. Allah might avert from you an evil that's equivalent to that which you asked. Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might give you better than that on the day of judgment. So your dua is accepted 100%. So once you come with this mentality of asked, Allah hasn't accepted it. That's it. Your dua is not accepted. وَتَوَسَّلَ إِلَيْهِ بِأَسْمَائِهِ وَصِفَاتِهِ وَتَوْحِيدِهِ And he draws near to his Lord by way of his perfect names and attributes and by way of tawheed. We know all of the hadith, okay, of the three men that were in a cave and they all made the wasila. And every single thing they came up with, they were, they were deeds that showed their ikhlas and their sincerity and their tawheed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that they only have done that which they have done for the sake of Allah. So, Naam, say, O oh Allah, if you know that I have done X, Y, and Z for your sake, yes, use that as tawassul. That is something that is mashru' that you mention your good deeds that you've done for the sake of Allah. Yes? Or you say, Oh Allah, Ya Razzaq, Urzuqni. Use His perfect names and attributes. Okay? Use the wasila. This is this one of the, this the legislative ways of doing wasila. وَقَدَّمَ بَيْنِ يَدَيْ دُعَائِهِ صَدَقَةً And even before you started dua, you gave some sadaqah. You want to take, Ya Ibn Al-Adam. You want to take, but you don't want to give. You want to take, take. You don't want to give. Give, Allah will give you. Give. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is, he is Al-Hamid. He's more generous than you. Whatever you give, Allah will give you tenfold, twentyfold, seven hundred times fold. You name it. But give. So Ibn Qayyim, he says, give sadaqah. So even before, like we said, you go to the masjid, you plan to go asr to the masjid, give sadaqah before you go there. Inshallah. فَإِنَّ هَذَا الدُّعَا He says, then this dua, لَا يَكَادُ يُرَدُّ أَبَدًا It's highly unlikely that such a dua is rejected. He says, Ibn Al-Qayyim. And who is Ibn Al-Qayyim? He is an expert in this bab. Yes? Allah. And when it comes to dua and, and you know things drawing near to Allah Ta'ala and things that soften your heart, he is he is he is Ibn Al-Qayyim. Rahmatullahi alayhi. So make dua, as much dua and seek forgiveness. Seek forgiveness. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you want to know which has how to seek forgiveness, then you should do the Sayyidul Istighfar. Sayyidul Istighfar is a dua. Which is the best way of seeking forgiveness. Allahumma anta rabbi la ilaha illa anta khalaqtani wa ana abduk wa ana ala ahadik wa adik masata'a to the end of the dua. A beautiful dua, full of tawheed. And you'll find it definitely in the link that I've sent you. Um, it's actually one of the first duas after the duas from the Quran. The Prophet Muhammad SAW said, He who supplicates in these terms during the day with firm belief in it and dies on the same day before the evening, he will be one of the dwellers of Jannah. You say it in the morning, you die before the evening, you are from Ahlul Jannah. And if anyone supplicates in these terms by saying this dua during the night with firm belief in it and dies before the morning, he'll be from the dwellers of Jannah. You say it in the night before you wake up that morning, Fajr. If you don't wake up and you die, you're from the people of Jannah. Narrated by Al-Bukhari. And all other good deeds that you can think of. We mentioned give sadaqah, read Quran between Asr and, and, and Maghrib or during the day as much Quran as you can, be good to your parents. Yani all of the good good deeds that you can think of. Tomorrow is the day. Tomorrow is the day, inshaAllah. Hada wallahu alamu sallallahu sallam ala nabiya Muhammad. Inshallah we'll conclude with that. Jazakum Allah khairan. Allahum alimna ma yinfa'una. Unfa'na bima alamtana. Wa zidna ilma. MashaAllah. I can see all of you shared a lot of resources, mashallah, in the chats. Um, I hope that Allah, I hope that the, the lecture was beneficial to you, inshallah. Uh, inshallah ta'ala, share it with others as well. I've given you the link to the YouTube uh, stream uh, as soon as we finish the lecture. Uh, it should be available to everyone. I'll post it again. Share it far and wide. Imagine anyone you, sh you share the lecture with, imagine they actually, it actually moves their heart and they make dua and they achieve good. Then know inshallah ta'ala you will receive your share of that.
يعني imagine you share this lecture and someone asked Dave Arafat tomorrow to become a scholar and Allah accepts his dua and he becomes a scholar imagine you are the you, you are the key to that good you know that a brother asked Allah Ta'ala to get married tomorrow and you know because of uh, this lecture or whatever and then he gets married and he builds a family and he has children and those children turn out to be you know scholars or benefit the ummah you, you, you're, you're, a, you're a key to that good inshallah you'll get your reward so please share the khair earn some ajr and don't deprive yourselves inshallah barakallah feekum Uh, question is it okay for a sister to also decide to spend the day or part of the day at the masjid tomorrow yeah that's okay it's fine it's permissible no problem even though her house is better for her but if for whatever reasons she wants to go to the masjid or more particularly because maybe she can't concentrate at home or whatever and her husband is fine with that if she's married and if she's not married then that's a different story then now she can go to the masjid no problem What about the countries where Arafah is not tomorrow? Kindly advice. Uh, Allah, I don't know what to say. <laughs> That's a whole different topic. Um, Allah, I don't know. I don't know. I can't answer that. Depends on which. Yani, Muslim country, non-Muslim country, there's, you know, there's more to it. Yani. Look, if you fast tomorrow, if it's the 8th and it's not Arafah, it's fine, fine. You still got a word for your fast. You make dua. Dua, dua is not just legislative. Don't, please, do not leave this lecture thinking that you only make dua on Dev Arafah. No. Dua is legislated 24-7 whenever you can. Yes? This whole lecture, the point of it was to just bring to your attention that if, you know, anything, tomorrow is the best day to make dua. But nevertheless, if you strive tomorrow, even though it's the 8th of the Hijjah in your locality, what did, did you lose out on anything? It's <laughs> مشكلة. Mashallah alayk. Yani, somehow, somehow we're jealous of you, mashallah. You've got, you've got two days of these 10 days left before Eid. We don't. So strive tomorrow and strive the day after on the day of Arafah in your locality. Fast both days, make dua both days. Do you know, What's the problem? You know? And if I got what the answer is going to be to your question should you follow your ma'arafa based on the hujjaj and you know the fact they're doing hajj you should follow Saudi Arabia or not or whatever and, like, before you go to that topic right make the most of your day if it's the 8th or the 9th doesn't matter make the most of your day tomorrow if it's the 8th and make even more of your day on the 9th inshallah if, if it's arafa uh, where you are and definitely you should do Eid with your locality anyway uh, specific, specifically if it's a Muslim country so yeah how does the one who is sick make the most of tomorrow as they cannot fast well if you're not able to fast no problem do everything else read Quran make dua يعني, you have to know that if what's stopping you from fasting is sickness and you were intending to fast or you would have fasted if it wasn't for that sickness you have the reward for of a fasting person rest assured Allah is the most generous. You got rewarded for that intention, alhamdulillah. Okay, so don't worry about that. But do everything else that you can. What about praying Fajr in, in Jama'ad and praying Duha in the Masjid? Beautiful. You can do that? Absolutely beautiful. Do that. Prophet Sallallahu mentioned that you will get the reward of Hajj and Umrah complete if you pray in the Masjid Fajr and you sit until Duha doing Dhikr. Amazing reward. Again, what if the sister isn't married? Then the same thing. Her house is better for her. But if she goes to the masjid, obviously she doesn't need to receive permission from any husband. But say, if, as far as her father is okay with her parents, they don't need her. She goes to the masjid. No problem. No problem. Her house is better for her, no doubt. But if she goes to the masjid, then that's permissible. I would only be able to start praying tomorrow. Can I still fast tomorrow without fasting today? Yeah, if you can pray tomorrow, you can fast and fast tomorrow. Yeah, without... Yeah. Without fasting today, you don't need to fast today. I actually, I actually tweeted about that today. Um, let me let me read the tweet. The tweet went around the lines of conversation I've had multiple times so far, and I think your question is also 
another occurrence, which is, do we fast for Arafah tomorrow? Literally, I had this conversation today with someone. Do we fast for Arafah tomorrow? I said, yes. They said, aren't we meant to also fast day after? I said, of course not. Day after is Eid. <laughs> oh, so we fast the day before? No. You're mixing up Arafah with Ashura. You're mixing up Arafah with the day of Ashura. You don't need to fast the day before or the day after. That relates to Ashura. Because the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, he saw the Jews fasting the day of Ashura. So he said, if I live till next year, I will fast the day before or the day after in order to oppose the Jews so that we don't end up fasting the same day as the Jews. So he said, we are going to fast Ashura because we are closer to Musa than you Jews. But because we don't want to be similar to you, we also going to add another day before or the day after. That relates to Ashura, not Yom Arafah. Yom Arafah, if you just fast on day of Arafah, that's fine. There's no problem. Okay? Wadih. So a lot of people, they have that misconception. They mix up between Ashura and Yom Arafah. Are you allowed to make dua in your first language and it be accepted? Can only read Arabic. Yeah, no problem. Of course you can. Yes, you can. I mean, the the, the, the link that I've sent you, you read it in English. No problem. You don't, don't feel like you have to read it in Arabic and then in English. لا. As a matter of fact, you're better off reading it in English so that you understand what you're asking for. That's why, alhamdulillah, I'm happy it's been translated. May Allah the word whoever did, did so. How do you have true certainty while making dua? Well, by having good thoughts of Allah. That Allah, inshallah, will accept your dua. Not making dua and being like, well, Allah is not going to accept it anyway. لا. Have like this, if you like, uh, trust in Allah that Allah will accept your dua. Are you able to make dua in your first day? We already answered that. Can someone fast if they have days to make up for Ramadan? Yes, they can. Yes, they can, inshallah. Because they can make up for Ramadan throughout the year, inshallah. So that doesn't stop them from fasting day of Arafah. Fast day of Arafah with intention with day of Arafah, and then after that, you can make up for whatever days you missed in Ramadan. Is the punishment for misdeeds greater if committed during the sacred months? Yes, absolutely it is. Just like the good deeds are multiplied, bad deeds are also multiplied. Uh, this query is off topic. Well, let's see. Can non-Arab sisters above the age of 40 be granted admission in Islamic sciences in Saudi universities with scholarship? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I have no idea. It's highly unlikely. But Allah knows best. Maybe sometime in the future, the way things are going now, maybe university soon might open up more so that maybe you can study. Maybe not with a scholarship, but by paying tuition fees, that might be possible in the near future. Allah knows best. But a scholarship, I'm not sure. Wallahi. If someone due to laziness not strive during these eight days, still that person have to strive today, it'll be worth for that person's stand. Absolutely. Why not? <laughs> Like I said, the best is still yet to come. <laughs> and imagine someone was lazy the first 20 days of Ramadan. Let's say first 26 days of Ramadan. Should he not do his best on the 27th night or 29th night or whatever, hoping that perhaps he might still catch Laylatul Qadr? Secondly, secondly, okay, what has gone has gone. But now going forward, yes, do your best. You don't know when, when death is going to come to you. Okay. Look, you can't do anything about what has gone, but you can do something about today and tomorrow. Okay, absolutely. As a matter of fact, the fact that you strive from this point onwards shows your sincerity and your truthfulness and that, you know, you're someone who takes heed. Alhamdulillah. Could it also be confusion over fasting on Friday alone? Yes, true, true. That could be the confusion as well. Uh, but the scholars, they've mentioned that if you fast the day of Arafah, alone, even though it's on a Friday, if you're fasting with the intention of Yom Arafah and not with the intention of fasting because it's Friday, it's permissible. Okay? No, no, some, some people actually asked it because of Ashura, and I know that. And based on my personal experience, I can't, I can't talk about the individual that asked here in the chat. But yeah, some people, because when you say to them, and in the personal experience, the, the, the conversations that I had, that was that was the reason, one of the reasons why. Will the Hajj be accepted for a woman who was menstruating while on Hajj? Is it allowed for a woman who is menstruating to go on Hajj? Yes, it is allowed. Um, but obviously, there are certain actions she can't do. 
she has to wait like the tawaf and ifad and stuff so she has to do that after um, but yeah she can like do other things like go mina and stuff that's permissible um, some of the wives of the Prophet Muhammad Sallam, their period started started while they're actually on Hajj okay so Hajj has got many different actions that you do some actions she needs to be Tahir for and some actions not okay And it is said that if you fast on a Friday, you should not fast day before or day after you too. Yeah, you shouldn't. Look, it's not about fasting a day before or after Friday. It's about the fact that you shouldn't fast on a Friday with the intention of fasting on a Friday. Right? But if that Friday there's something happening, something going on, for a specific reason, you want you, you end up fasting, then that's, that's fine. For example, the individual who fasts alternate days. One day he's fasting, one day he breaks his fast. The fast of Dawood alayhi salam. Obviously, probably once every fortnight his fast is gonna be on a Friday without fasting on Thursday or fasting on Saturday but that's fine because he's following that pattern he didn't fast intentionally on Friday seeking out Friday as a day to fast that's what's not permissible that you be like Friday is the best day of the week you know what I want to do the best action I'm going to fast like, that's not permissible do you get my point so it's not a condition that you always fast the day before Friday or the day after you know that like, it's about you not fasting Friday because of it being Friday. The one who's fasting alternate days, he will end up fasting Friday and not fasting Thursday or Saturday, but that's fine. The one who's gonna fast day of Arafah only, he's gonna fast Arafah, he's not gonna fast on Saturday. If you miss today, you've missed it. That shouldn't stop you from fasting tomorrow, inshallah. Okay? Most people seeking to fast on Thursdays because of the hadith of not selecting Friday, Friday alone for fasting except one is fasting the day before or the day after. Yes, absolutely. You can't select Friday on itself to fast, but you're not selecting Friday. You're fasting Friday because it's Arafah. Okay, inshallah, I'll send a clip regarding that from one of the scholars. So that's what scholars, they mentioned that you're fasting Friday because it's your Arafah. You're not fasting because it's Friday. Well, I hope that's clear. What are those purple books behind you? <laughs> it's a collection given by uh, one of the, um, if you like, Jamiyas uh, here. It's a mixture of different books, some tafsir, some this. It's a collection you get from this organization for free here in Saudi. How can I protect people from the fitna between the Salafis? As I know people who got caught up in it, I would like to advise from an elder like you. Well, I don't get don't get caught up between fitna between the Salafis. Yani, goes without saying there should be no fitna between Salafis Alhamdulillah if any advice take the advice of the scholars do as the scholars do simple as yani, and when I say take advice of the scholars and follow the scholars there's one thing you need to know the scholars as a whole yes yes you should follow them right but yani, how can I put it you're not going to find all of the scholars of the ummah Yes, agreeing on something that's batil. Prophet ﷺ said, لا تجتمع أمتي على ضلالة That my ummah will not all agree upon a misguidance. Right? So you just follow the scholars, generally speaking. Yes? And if you find issues between two scholars that are both Salafi, right? Then look at what the other scholars are doing. Right? Follow their path. Right? If the other scholars are keeping themselves out of, out of it, and they hold both scholars to be Salafi, why should you get involved? Yeah, and if the likes of Sheikh Salah al Fawzan, Sheikh Abdul Muhsin Abbas, Sheikh Salah al Suhaimi, and these great Imams of our times, you know, uh, if they're not getting involved, why should you as a miskin get involved? So, <laughs> that's, just, that's enough, right? As a, as, a, as, a, as a reason for you to think twice. And that, that would be my advice, really, you know? End of the day, leave these issues to the scholars. You do that which is wajib upon you. Which is worship your Lord, seek knowledge, and draw near to Allah Taala, and fulfill His rights and fulfill the rights of His creation. To have to raise our hands when making du'a, yes, you should, is one of the things, the factors that make your du'a more likely to be accepted. From the mannerisms of du'a, you don't have to, but it is good. When one is praying in the masjid, then how do they give out sadaqa charity to the most deserving from the poor and needy? Eight categories while they are present in the masjid. Online, this day and age, I would say go online. <laughs> you know, just make a transfer. 
Um, yeah, I don't know how else you could do it. Or even before, you do, I mean, you don't have to give sadaqah while you're in the masjid anyway. I don't know why you're stipulating you want to give sadaqah while in the masjid. I don't know of any narration or something that says that it's more virtuous to give sadaqah while you're inside the masjid. Give the sadaqah before you get to the masjid. What's the problem? To someone that you know, transfer it to them and then go to the masjid. Alhamdulillah. Please, uh, can you put us, your students, and every other Muslim in your du'as? Absolutely, inshallah. Inshallah. Ustad, please clarify the issue of being able fasting only on Friday. Is Arafah being different from fasting Thursday before being able to fast Friday? Some say you must fast today to fast tomorrow. No, I'll send you I'll send you a clip, inshallah, from the scholars. I'll send you some resources in the channel. Barakallahu fiku. If you're fasting tomorrow because you're Arafah, then that's fine. I Ustad, if someone wastes time during these sacred months, then the punishment is double. So, what is the best way to repent for? Does that person earn a lot of anger for wasting time? No, look. You waste, I mean, no, you don't earn a lot of anger for just wasting time just like that. I and mean, in Nam, you'll be asked about what you put your time towards, but then we have to define what is wasting time. And, you know, sometimes you might not be wasting time. There's nothing wrong with relaxing or, you know, doing some sort of. You know, something that is recreational. Yani, we have to define what's meant by wasting time, to be honest. Alright? Uh, will the Hajj be accepted for a woman who's... Uh, someone already asked that. If someone wants to start to seeking his journey towards seeking vision knowledge and he makes dua, what other asbab he she should take along with dua? If they can, travel and go and sit under the scholars. If not, um, then I would say... Um, you know, find some scholars, rules of the scholars, and follow it. And one of the greatest aspects that you can take as well is learning the Arabic language. And uh, yeah, definitely, that's one of the greatest aspects that you can take. Learning the Arabic language is the key to knowledge. Okay, there are a lot of fiqh, fiqh questions here. Well, I can't ask them. Right, I can't answer them right now. Um. As a matter of fact, I think I'm going to have to uh, wrap it up here, going over time. Let me just quickly see if there are any questions that are related to our lesson today. If he or she is staying in a place where there are nearly no scholars around the city, for example, Germany, then seek knowledge online, inshallah, with someone that is trustworthy and upon the sunnah. Is it better to make dua in private? If you can, yes, definitely. But if you're like in the masjid or something, it shouldn't stop you from making dua. Do we have to raise our hands when making dua of the morning and evening? Uh, not that I know of. Remember, inshallah. If someone is seeking marriage and would like to make dua about this affair because they found a suitable mate, should they keep their dua general or specific and mention names? Well, I would say make a general dua asking Allah for a good husband or wife. And when it comes to this particular individual, I would say pray Salat al-Istikhara. Okay, if you made up your mind, then pray Salat al-Istikhara. And Allah Ta'ala will inshallah give you tawfiq to do that which is best. I post as the question is there are extremes like people who are listening to Yasir Qadri make excuses for him and people who are preoccupied in reputation. He said, um, Yasir Qadi, Yasir Qadi, I mean, I don't know, if, if, if you're the same person that was asking about fitna between Salafis, then Yasir Qadi doesn't belong in that, in that category, does he? We're talking about Salafis, people upon the Sunnah, not people that are misguided deviants. May Allah Ta'ala rectify him and rectify all of our affairs. Is it a must to shed tears in dua? No, it's not. No, it's not a must. It's not a must to shed tears. La, that's, that comes from Allah. Some people there... They're more likely to cry. They got softer hearts than others, you know. The fact that you're shedding tears doesn't mean, you know, that your dua is better than someone else or something. Sometimes you see people that are crying croc crocodile tears and then they leave the masjid and they get involved with all of their things that are not permissible. So no, that is not that is not a, a, a mi'yar or a measure of how sincere your dua is or how good your dua is. If those tears come out, alhamdulillah, if they don't, I have no problem. Yani keep on making dua, inshallah. It's not a must at all. Can you please share the link to the dua book you mentioned? It's in the channel. Someone did post it here as well. I'm going to share the link to uh, 
the web page I've shared that before and if you join the channel inshallah I'll post the PDF there as well okay I hope all of you that Allah Ta'ala accepts your ibadah tomorrow, that He accepts your du'as, and uh, that He makes this Eid a blessing for you and your family. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.